I have not had such a luminous guest on my ship for quite some time. I have an idea of what he is about to say, but one can never tell with this particular stripe of Inquisitor, Ordo Hereticus. They have a distinctly single-minded way of looking at things, as do all Inquisitors. But they never link the dots. They never understand the widespread repercussions of their actions. It comes from specializing in one discipline too much. It becomes all-consuming. So many of our brethren Astartes do the same. They fall into the trap of being exceptional at one discipline. So they lose track of the need to be competent at all. Flexibility. A strength unto itself. He sits there with his face raised and his nose wrinkled, like being here offends his sensibilities. His nose most of all, it seems. But with a hawk-like beak like that, it is no wonder it is the most pronounced of his senses. I stare passively, waiting for him to shatter the silence. He is used to others breaking under his gaze and babbling out their greatest secrets. Inquisitors. <laughs> only human. He goes tired of the standoff. His excitement to cut to the chase is almost crackling off him like lightning. Thank you for your time, Captain. I know you Dark Angels are so very, very busy. Always skulking about and so rarely with a recorded presence. Like shadows. Let's save some time, shall we, Inquisitor? You have a whole galaxy of old women and simpletons to put to the question then burn, slapping yourself on the back all of the way at how you have single-handedly saved an Imperium that has lasted millennia before you were born and will survive millennia after your life has run its course. And there we have it, the Dark Angel sneer. Your Astartes think you are so much better than the rest of us mere mortals. I have seen things you would not believe. You overbone tin pot, get to the point. Why are you here? I thought it important to let you know before I take my findings to the High Council. What exactly, little man? He takes out his pick, places it daintily on my desk and slides it across to me. I know what I will see. The image contains scenes of a gaggle of tainted traitors all wearing power armour. My gorge rises as I see the element he has so clearly enhanced for my viewing pleasure. A marine in green armour. A dark angel by his markings. One of the fallen. Cat got your tongue. I push back the picked caster and stare at him at the smug smirk nestled under his beak. I have long held suspicions that your Astartes are not to be trusted. You are power-armoured cannon fodder. Your myth, especially that of the mighty fighting first, is built on lies. Now I see that your oh-so-vaunted purity is an utter baseless fable. I rise from my chair and slowly pad towards the door. I am taking my surroundings, like I am choosing my words carefully. So, you have a blurry pick and an axe to grind. Why should this concern me? It is the evidence that I have long yearned for. The evidence that you Dark Angels are up to no good, as they say. I came merely to see the look in your eyes. So little shock, so little rage. Nothing. Now that I've seen it, I am quite sure that you were aware that this may be discovered. Time to find out a bit more, I think. I suppose you have already informed your colleagues that our downfall is imminent, 
and your speech to the order is a mere formality. I pick up a small object, a medal. I project that I am looking at the fate of our glorious legion, my brothers of all Dark Angels chapters being thrown into the mud as I walk past him, calmly, slowly. He stays silent. Time to make certain. You know that the legend of the Dark Angels is sacrosanct. The entire Imperium, every man, woman and child looks to our deeds, our honor, our sacrifice, our legend. They look, and no matter how bad things may seem, no matter how hopeless, they believe in us. They believe in the first. They believe we are the Dark Angels of Wrath that are sent by the Emperor himself to save them. It buoys them up, it gives them hope. Would you throw that away so easily? Is it worth it over one picked Inquisitor? Don't lecture me, Captain. The Imperium will survive, it will become stronger. Because it will be built on truth. Better to cut the infection now than allow it to spoil the entire well. I came to be certain, which I now am. I will take my leave and report to my colleagues when I tell them it is inevitable. Your days are done. So, you are going for the big reveal. Your moment in the sun. Is the morale of the Imperium's fighting men and citizenry worth this? I ask you to reconsider. He leaps to his feet, standing to give a very well-rehearsed speech. But he does not turn. He can see the pics flashing around him in his mind's eye. Feeble egotist. No! You will be brought to justice, all of you. When I drop this bombshell, it will be the crowning glory of my career. They will say forevermore that it was I who took down an entire chapter, an entire legion of traitors, that I, Cassius Com... I look at the lifeless body slumped on my desk. He did not hear me creep up behind him. Some always believe that big means slow and heavy. He did not notice my hands were on his head and shoulder until it was too late. I will now have to execute his entourage and dispose of his ship. I would say it is a waste, but from his opinions I feel that I have done the Imperium a great service today. I will drink to him though, for he has brought to my attention one of the fallen. It has been some time. I prepare myself to commune with the inner circle of the Council. I will need support. The sector from the Pict is rife with traitors. I will need the aid of my brothers to do this efficiently, cleanly and swiftly. Months. It has taken months, but now we are ready. It is about to begin. Long have my brothers and I sat on this ship, sound at a minimum, quietly sliding through space on our velocity alone. Nothing but the most basic of life support. It has allowed me to drill the men thoroughly. We are ready, as we always are, but this must work seamlessly. It must work without a single error. We will not be swayed from our course, our target. One may look at what we are doing and say it is a waste of resources, but it is not. As I stated to the Inquisitor, our legend is more important than anything, as it keeps the entire Imperium afloat, keeps it together, allows the beleaguered worlds, populations and the fighting forces of humanity to remain keen, thinking maybe if they hold on longer, we, the Dark Angels, will save them. We don't always, but often enough we do. Plus, these scum do indeed need to be winkled out from this system. It was not the highest priority before, as it is a smaller renegade fleet. But while we are here, we will sweep house. 
we will purge these scum in the name of the Emperor. The commander of this vessel is well briefed. Nothing shall go wrong. As I stand in a comms section adjacent to the Teleportarum, I look at our trajectory in the time and date stamp. We are only seconds away. I am calm. I clear my mind before the combat. Panic, frenzy, rage and other emotions. Ha! <laughs> they are for the later legions and their chapters. We are dark angels. We were built for this. We do not do it because we enjoy it. We do not do it because we are filled with zeal of the religious. For we adhere to the imperial truth. We do it because it is our job. It is why we exist. I watch the time counter as we approach the enemy fleet. There must be two dozen ships awaiting us, but only three cruisers. No battle barges. The rest are frigates and escorts. We are, on paper, outnumbered. But for months we have ploughed toward them on velocity alone, silently, stealthily taking a tactic straight from the playbook of the Alpha Legion. Ironic and effective. To turn the weapons and tactics of the enemy back on them. Satisfying. It is time. This is not a drill. This is not a drill. I flick one switch, indicating to the commander to begin. Outside in the colder space, a thousand flares explode in quick succession, filling the night with light. We have all been dropping them since we set off, at regular intervals to create the maximum effect. The Auspex scanners of the Renegade fleet will be blind for up to a minute after this. Plenty of time for us to get in amongst them. Immediately. There is a shuddering in the ship and lights come on all around me as the main engines fire up. I see the Deathwing Knights standing in the corridor awaiting my signal to enter the teleportarum. They are ready. The battle begins. As soon as our Auspex is up, I can see the others, a full battle barge each, from my brothers of the successor chapters. The Angels of Redemption, Angels of Wrath, and persecutors of darkness. Each one commanded by a chapter master, no less. If it were any other situation, I would take orders from them, but we are hunting a fallen, so I hold command, as I am a Dark Angel chapter captain, and higher in the inner circle. Four of us against two dozen of them, but we will be in amongst them, and they are blind. The commander then launches the two sets of discharges I instructed. One containing drop pods towards the surface of the planet, the other to discharge boarding missiles at the Renegade's flagship and other cruisers. The Auspex plots the path of the pods and shows them entering the atmosphere with their support craft, all in black. The Ravenwing will prepare the way. I also note that the other ships of our Omega Force have launched their boarding missiles into the other cruisers, as we agreed. Soon Dark Angels and their brother successor Astartes will be ranging the decks and corridors of the enemy fleet, causing pandemonium fighting their way to the bridges and engine rooms. The renegades won't have time to know what hit them. But the Auspex shows me that there is some talent in our adversaries as fire starts arcing towards our ship. It is feeble. Despite our void shields being down for a very specific reason, it would do no more than scuff our paint. At this range, our firepower pops escorts like pimples. They turn and attempt to flee, 
reducing the fire coming in to this old warhorse. We need only weather a minute or two to allow the Ravenwing to do their job, to get near the central encampment where the traitor is being fated as a salubrious guest, no doubt. Moments pass, but the light swiftly shines. They have dropped the teleport beacon. I signal to the commander that I am leaving and march the few steps to the teleport harem surrounded by five Deathwing Knights. Our ancient and hallowed tactical Dreadnought Terminator armor is slow and heavy, but we have trained for decades in how to use it. We leave. Appearing on the planet, it is as it should be. All is ablaze, and craters and bodies litter the traitor camp. The Ravenwing fly above us in jets and speeders, the roar of their bikes a distant thing as they harry and confuse the enemy, allowing us our window. A machine gun nest fires down on us, its slugger shot bouncing off our Terminator armor and large storm shields without any effect. <laughs> the nest is silenced by a passing vengeance land speeder. The Ravenwing do not disappoint. We are directly before the main building in this travesty of a camp. Why they were here, I don't even care. The knights take point and charge the building. I fire a few storm bolter shots and see them blow chunks off the wall. It is weak. The knights now accelerate and I follow them. We plow straight into the wall and burst straight through it. The knights make short work of anything inside. Their flails wielded with discipline. They smash aside the smaller and less armoured traitor Astartes in front of us. They fly like rag dolls or crumple like paper structures. We move into the heart of the facility. The last door is torn down and the last two figures remain. A chaos lord stands in the fore, his axe perpetually dripping an ocean of blood. I leave him to the knights. I snap my arm up and fire my storm bolter at the other figure. His green armor explodes on his right side as his arm is torn off from his body and he is thrown back. I have crippled him for certain, but I will have my prey. He is Astartes. He will not die of this before the knights have crushed this chaos lord and cleared the path to the body. I look forward to passing him into the keeping of the chaplain. He is ours. One more stain to be removed from our honor. One more step towards redemption. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Bolnamort, and I wish to introduce you to the forces and factions of the Warhammer 40k universe. Today, we will be exploring the mighty fighting First Legion, the original Astartes, who were the first to accompany the Emperor of Mankind into his wars, the illustrious Dark Angels. I would have it noted that I am not a Dark Angel player, in case any wonder from my approach to this faction. I can only ever say it how I see it. 
The Dark Angels are the first of the Illusiones Astartes, the illusions of space marines that were forged by the genetic engineering and, some say, dark pacts made by the master of mankind, the Emperor, were forces none will openly admit. With his space marines he not only unified Terra, the grim dark name for Earth, but he then went on to conquer the lion's share of the Milky Way galaxy. Pun intended. Each of the legions was made to perform a very specific task, and all had their specialities. Some, like the World Eaters and Blood Angels, were things of rage and butchery. Some, like the Raven Guard and the Alpha Legion, were things of stealth and subtlety. Some, like the Iron Hands and Imperial Fists, were stoic and steadfast. Some project that they are perfect, like the Ultramarines and the Emperor's Children. But what of the Dark Angels? The Dark Angels were the first Legion, the very first to be recruited, trained and then deployed by the Emperor in his wars. They fought alongside him, and were initially his only Legion, while the numbers of the others grew. Many Legions eventually took part in the Unification Wars, but it was the first, the Dark Angels, who fought most and fought longest. Their banners groan with the accolades and penance of their victories. Their glory was only ever eclipsed by one other legion, the Lunar Wolves. But this is a story for another time. The Dark Angels are always seen by some as a second option. Second place in nearly all disciplines, all methods of war. Not as furious as Black Templars or Blood Angels, not as good a defense as Imperial Fists, etc., as I have stated. But there is a secret in this chapter. No, it is not the one you may be thinking of that I will go into in more detail very soon. It is not the fallen, gentle listener. The secret in the grim darkness of the future is very simple. The Dark Angels are the most dangerous of all of the legions of the Emperor, for they are not specialized but they can perform any of the specializations with nearly the same effect as their brothers of those roles. They are, simply put, the most adaptable, the most flexible, the most well-rounded and most dangerous force of marines that the Emperor commands outside of the Grey Knights. But this is not only due to their well-rounded attributes, no. There is something that many choose to ignore of late, the limelight being firmly fixed on the one person and their lesion. I will not mention here, but it has drawn the truth away from its rightful place. Lion L. Johnson, the Lord and Primarch of the Dark Angels, was a natural genius at combat and at tactics. His ability was not that of the hard grafters who have to prepare the right ground, overwhelming numbers, tricks and traps to win, for there are a plethora of Pompeys amongst the ranks of the Primarchs, each one a terror on the battlefield but also a horror to face as a general. But here, in the prime arc of the First Legion, Lion L. Johnson was a Gaius Julius Caesar, an Alexander, a natural. The Lion needed only to flick an eye across an unfolding battle map to see where his enemy was weak and where its strength actually was, no matter the attempt to obfuscate. As with all of the Primarchs and their sons, their Space Marines, the Dark Angels have inherited this astonishing ability. They take to a battlefield like a duck to water. Yes, they are trained with vigour and discipline, but it is their natural affinity for war that is perhaps their most profound attribute. As such, many a lore master or player, writer of Black Library or store owner will forget who they are. They are the first. They are un touchable, and would carve through all but one of the Loyalist Legions like a hot knife through butter. It is often stated numbers do not win a battle. As such, I must make my point clear. Despite not having this army and having no natural requirement or drive to lord them so highly, they are the force that actually keeps the Imperium together. Well, the Space Marines. They are the Legion chapter or force that should be the most awaited and the most appreciated when they do attend a field of conflict, an arena of war. For any who would question this evaluation, for I hope there are many, discussion is such an important part of this hobby, 
I would remind you of only one detail. A secret shrouded in the darkest periods of the Great Crusade. A conflict so terrible and costly that its memory has been struck from all Imperial records by the direction of the Emperor himself. The conflict is shrouded in darkness, but it is guessed that it may have taken the two lost legions, either just their Primarch or their legion entire, the Rang Dang Zeno sides. A war so terrible that it was mentioned to be almost comparable to the Horus heresy. So hotly contested and so bitter was it. All that is known for certain is one thing. The war ended when the mighty First Legion was sent to destroy the Rangdan in the Third Xenocide. They lost over 50,000 Marines, thus losing their status as the most numerous Legion, but they won. They wiped the Rangdan off the face of the galaxy. Compared to this, no other Legion can come even close, bar perhaps, just perhaps, the Lunar Wolves before they fell. Or maybe the Imperial Fists in the defense of the Imperium during the Heresy. Thus are the Dark Angels a mighty army and one that is proud. Thus it was always to be vulnerable to that which happened later. The betrayal of its second brightest light. The right hand man and best friend of the Primarch Lionel Johnson. Luther. We cannot go into all of that tale today, for this is only an introduction. But let us now pull back the curtain and gaze at the thing that the Dark Angels hide from all. We will now lean on existing wisdom for the events that scarred this legion, its subsequent chapters, and every marine who has ever worn the green since that day. A secret that has been held for over 10,000 years. The Fall of Caliban in the aftermath of the Horus Heresy, the surviving Loyalists rallied the reeling Imperium. The Dark Angels took a significant part in these battles, which later came to be called the Scouring. As they pursued the rebels, the Lion diverted to nearby Caliban, which had been enshrouded by warp storms since Horus's betrayal. For Lionel Johnson, one final act of treachery remained to be discovered. As the Dark Angels' fleet moved into orbit, they were met by a barrage of defense laser fire. Ships exploded, plummeting into the planet like monstrous comets. Although stunned by the sudden attack, Johnson's superhuman reactions allowed what remained of the fleet to disengage, withdrawing to safety. The betrayal Johnson unraveled shook him to his very core. Over the decades, Luther had brooded, nurturing a seed of jealousy. His hatred had spread, poisoning those under his command and several generations of new recruits. His powerful oratory had twisted their hearts with an all-consuming hatred of the new Imperium. Like Horus, Luther had been corrupted. His pride had been all the opening the Dark Gods needed to make him their own. The fury of Lionel Johnson and the remaining loyal Dark Angels knew no bounds. They had fought across the galaxy but had arrived too late to aid their Emperor. Still, they had thought the Dark Powers routed, only to find their own home world, their own brethren corrupted and turned against them. Even as the horrors of the situation sunk in, Johnson formulated a battle plan. It began with the massed guns of the fleet disabling Caliban's defense laser batteries and driving the rebel Dark Angels into the shelter of their force field protected fortress monasteries. Knowing that one surgical strike could end the conflict, Lionel Johnson personally led an assault on the greatest monastery of the Old Order. He knew that this was where he would find Luther, and so it was that the two former friends faced each other. Although the Primarch possessed immense power, the two opponents were equally matched, for Luther's abilities were enhanced by vast forces gifted to him by the Dark Gods of Chaos. What followed was a fight of titanic proportions. As the two adversaries traded blows, shockwaves shook the monastery, causing chunks of masonry to crash down around them. Outside, the guns of the Dark Angels' fleet pounded the planet, reducing the other monasteries to miles-wide craters. 
angry magma spewing from the wounds gouged into the planet's crust. Caliban's surface began to crack under the bombardment, and the fury of the Dark Angels blinded them to the devastation they were wreaking. As the planet broke apart, the battle between Johnson and Luther reached its climax. Already weakened by the long fight, Luther staggered, leaving an opening, but despite his rage, Lionel Johnson could not bring himself to slay his former friend. As he hesitated, Luther unleashed a furious psychic attack that knocked Johnson to his knees and left him mortally wounded. As the dying Primarch struggled to stand, a veil was lifted from Luther's eyes and he realized the full extent of his deeds. His was a triple betrayal of his friend, of the Dark Angels, and of the Emperor. The truth shattered his sanity and he slumped down beside the ailing Johnson, issuing a cry of pain and despair that echoed through the warp. Upon hearing that sound, the Chaos Gods realized that, once more, they had been denied. They howled in frustration, and across the galaxy, psychers fell to their knees. So powerful was the cry that a rent appeared in the fabric of space, and a warp storm emerged to engulf what remained of Caliban. Those fallen Dark Angels, who had served under Luther, were sucked from the broken surface into the warp and cast throughout time and space. The remains of Caliban, weakened by the bombardment, were ripped asunder, destroyed in a last apocalyptic explosion. Only a single part of the planet survived the vortex that pulled the rest of the crumbling debris into the warp. Protected by an ancient force field, the ruins of the fortress monastery and a massive chunk of the planet's bedrock still remained, held together and floating alone in the empty vacuum of space. The Dark Angels flew down to the surface of the remaining rock and gazed in horror at what was left of their once verdant homeworld. At the heart of the empty wasteland they found Luther, bloody, cringing and gibbering, but they were unable to extract anything coherent out of the shell of a man who had once been Johnson's closest friend. Luther repeated the same words over and over again. The Primarch had been carried away by the Watchers in the Dark, and one day he would return to forgive Luther for the terrible sins he had committed. Of Lionel Johnson, there was no sign. The Rock. In the days that followed, the Dark Angels made the Rock their new home. They explored the vast halls and dungeons beneath the fortress monastery, claiming the hordes of weapons and machinery that had lain there since the age of technology. A great labor was begun, carving out deeper catacombs into the bedrock, excavating room for an entire lesion. With the aid of tech priests of Mars, docks were added to house spacecraft. After centuries of work, warp engines were outfitted as well, allowing the rock to traverse the galaxy. For all its capabilities, the rock remains a gloomy sight, chains of lightning arcing across its craggy features, its force fields rent with cracks. The fortress monastery of the Dark Angels is as indelibly marked by Caliban's destruction as its inhabitants. The Hunt for the Fallen The Fallen's continued existence is anathema to the Dark Angels, a persistent stain on their honor that those who turned upon the Lion and caused his demise are still alive is an affront to the space marines that were made in his image. For the unforgiven to be redeemed, their traitorous brothers must be hunted down and made to repent. As the decades since the fall of Caliban turned to centuries, the inner circle took shape. It grew from an ad hoc conclave to a formal, if still furtive, organization that spread through not just the Dark Angels, but their successor chapters as well. With no home world save the Rock, recruitment planets were founded, and new generations of Dark Angels were added to replace those lost in battle. The regimens and drills of the chapter were strict, with special emphasis on brotherhood and loyalty. Ideals passed directly on to their successor chapters as well. However, the masters and elder warriors who led the instruction told the neophytes nothing of the sin of their forefathers. By the halfway point of the 32nd millennium, only a few interred within the sarcophagi of dreadnoughts were left of those that survived the Battle of Caliban. The truth of what occurred and knowledge of the fallen became secret. Secrets carried only by the small number of inner circle brethren within each unforgiven chapter. 
As veterans rise through the unseen levels of trust, more of the truth is gradually revealed to them by ranking members of the inner circle. Only then will they realize that in the millennia since the fall of Caliban, the sons of the Lion have been fulfilling their duties to the Emperor, while at the same time carrying out a hidden agenda, scouring the galaxy for signs of the corrupted kin. Whether operating alone or in small bands, each of the fallen that found their own ways of surviving the millennia since Luther's betrayal. A great many have embraced the power of the Dark Gods, becoming true heretic Astartes, and in the wake of the Great Rift, some of these have even ascended to demonhood. Others have survived as leaders of small piratical or cultist corps, or have been discovered attempting to live a nomadic existence on the fringes of the Imperium. A notable few have risen to be tyrants of entire planetary empires, with multiple worlds at their command. As time means nothing in the warp, sometimes a fallen appears upon a world having just, to his frame of reference, been plucked from the disintegrating surface of Caliban. The thousands of intervening years have passed are, to him, just a blinking of an eye within the abyss of insanity that is the warp. Usually driven wild with rage, such individuals launch themselves upon the hapless servants of the Imperium, a terrible force of vengeance and raving aloud those secrets their inner circle have worked so long to keep silent. There are those among the Fallen who regret their betrayal of their Primarch. Unable to reconcile themselves with their former order, they lead a forlorn, hunted existence. Many become mercenaries or rogue traders, roaming the edges of the galaxy as masterless men. Some attempt to atone for their sins, integrating themselves into human societies to work towards a noble cause. The Dark Angels often go for years, even decades, without finding any rumors or clues as to the whereabouts of one of the Fallen. When traces of the Fallen are detected, the Ravenwing and Deathwing are deployed. While both companies have gained fame from their many triumphs against the Imperium's enemies, it is for the Unforgiven's nefarious task that they are truly trained and equipped. The Ravenwing are the ultimate hunters and scouts, harrying their quarry into a position of vulnerability before their brothers in the Deathwing arrive, the mailed fist board swiftly down to inflict the killing blow. Any captured fallen are taken back to the rock. Deep inside its dungeons, interrogator chaplains inflict terrible excruciation in order to force their disgraced kin to repent. Occasionally they do, and for their pains, they die quickly. More often than not, however, the captured foreign refuses and suffers a long, drawn-out and agonizing death at the hands of those who would save his soul. Many of these defiant traitors meet their ends with curses upon their lips, knowing their corrupted souls will find a different kind of salvation in the warp, while others simply accept it as the price they pay for cleaving to the beliefs that led them to betray their brothers in the first place. The Raven Wing Black-clad huntsmen and masters of the art of lightning warfare, the Raven Wing race up before their chapter like thunder before a storm. Prizing speed and mobility above all else, they are an integral part of the Dark Angel's battlefield strategies, as well as a powerful asset in the unforgiven secret quest. Engines roaring, the Ravenwing tear forward, dodging enemy fire while moving at breakneck speed. These are the warriors of the Dark Angel's second company, a highly specialized formation that fights from fast-moving attack vehicles. They are assembled from the finest riders and pilots in the chapter, and their skills are further honed upon induction. Though the true purpose of their specialist training remains unknown by the wider Imperium, they have become renowned for their skill at mobile warfare. The majority of the Ravenwing fight from the saddle of Space Marine bikes, supported by brothers piloting various marks of land speeder or atmospheric assault fighters. The Ravenwing are ideal for fast assault missions, and elements of their company can often be found acting as an outrider at reconnaissance force for larger, Dark Angels' armies. Their far-ranging land speeders search for the telltale signs of the foe, voxing back information on enemy movements and dispositions. When the moment is right, the Ravenwing gun their engines and roar into the fight, a hurtling gale of black armor blazing guns and roaring chainswords, 
that sweep aside any and all resistance. With but a word, the Ravenwing can switch between a variety of perfectly drilled attack patterns in order to encircle, flank, break apart, or otherwise harass their foes. At all times, they strive to avoid becoming bogged down, swiftly dissecting even the largest enemy force with their hit-and-run attacks. Overhead, Nephilim, jet fighters, and Dark Talons keep their skies clear of enemy craft, while land speeders dart into position to unload their impressive firepower. Should an especially dangerous or vital target present itself, the Ravenwing mounts teleport homers upon their bikes that allow them to summon the warriors of the Deathwing to the battlefield. Not only does the arrival of their Terminator armored brethren all but guarantee victory, it also gives a clue to the true, veiled purpose of the Ravenwing, one that is altogether more sinister in nature. Known only to the Grand Master and to the carefully selected inner circle members of the Black Knight's elite, that the Ravenwing are tasked with hunting down and running to ground our fallen Dark Angels. The nature of those they track is why every member of the Ravenwing must be not only an expert rider or pilot, but must also fervently be dedicated to his chapter. More than any other force, the brothers of the Ravenwing are likely to be exposed to the pernicious lies of the fallen. They must therefore be unquestioning in their faith and are monitored closely at all times by their chaplain to ensure no chinks appear in their armor of indoctrination. The Deathwing Renowned as one of the finest fighting forces in the Imperium, the Deathwing are their chapter's mailed fist. No foe is too great for them to subdue, and no mission is too difficult or dangerous for them to complete. Their reputation is such that the mere sight of their bone-white armor is enough to put many foes to flight. The Deathwing are the Dark Angel First Company. Unlike the elite battle brothers of most Space Marine chapters, they fight clad exclusively in ancient suits of Terminator armor, each a nigh impenetrable relic from a bygone age. That the Dark Angels can equip all of their veterans this way speaks volumes of the wealth of relics hidden within the rock, and also an indication of how seriously the chapter takes the Deathwing's true mission to ruthlessly eliminate the Fallen. The Hammer of the Inner Circle, the Deathwing, is an assault force capable of teleporting straight into the midst of battle, ripping the heart out of the enemy with a well-placed strike while withstanding tremendous amounts of return fire. Only Dark Angels have shown incredible skills at arms, and total loyalty to their chapter can undergo the exacting rites of initiation required to join the Deathwing. Those who survive the mental, physical, and spiritual rigors of this ritual take their place among the ranks of their chapter's elite. Upon a Dark Angel's ascension to the Deathwing, the truth of what occurred on Caliban in the wake of the heresy will gradually be imparted to them by ranking members of the Inner Circle. As they learn more and more of the tragic events, the warriors' feelings of shame and contempt for their fallen brothers grow, and the more of themselves they give over to the tireless quest for vengeance and absolution. In battle, this knowledge makes the Deathwing beacons of righteous fury, leading their brothers to mercilessly destroy any who would oppose them. Every warrior of the company is utterly devoted, following the commands of their superiors without question, and willingly performing any act in the name of the hunt. For this reason, very few Dark Angels' strike forces go to war without at least one squad of Deathwing on hand, prepared to carry out those orders from Chapter Command that Battle Brothers outside of the Inner Circle would find abhorrent. Those who enter the Deathwing may suppose they have learned all there is to know of the Dark Angel's shadowed past, but they have merely entered the first ring of the clandestine organization known as the Inner Circle. There remain circles within circles, and the veterans of the company have learned still more of their history. These warriors are given the title of Deathwing Knights, and their noble fury in battle and dedication to the chapter is the stuff of legend.
We know the history of this glorious chapter in Legion. We know their secret and how they deal with it. Why it is so important to them and how they view safeguarding their secret as actually protecting the morale and very fiber of the Imperium entire. We know that the Dark Angels have now realized that the Primaris Marines are not the stooges that they suspected, as one of the inner circle has now crossed the Rubicon Primaris, has become a Primaris Space Marine. Now we come to my favorite part. We go off script. For I have little to say that has not already been said, but it does require to be said. As per the bunker meme, all other loyalist players who cannot handle some raw truths, please leave now. Now that we are alone. How dare they? One tract in one goddamn book spewed from the vile moor of a known traitor has been used to vilify, castigate and deride the Dark Angels. The first for decades. And I am sick of it. Sick of the lazy memes that are taunts that unbelievably obtuse and tedious vectors used to deride the Dark Angels. All done at the instigation of those chapter players who ha cannot handle the unabridged and very simple truth. Only one other legion have even a hope of stopping a Dark Angel army when they march to war. The Volca Fenrica. Because they were designed to kill Marines, but in any other situation, the Dark Angels win out. Against any enemy that is not a Marine, the Space Wolves also fail in their test. And the Dark Angels have harbored their strength, have hoarded their archaeotech and weaponry. They have always really remained a legion, all in preparation for the return of the Lion. Oh, but there are those who fear the waking of this mighty son of the Emperor. It was a known fact that all of the other Primarchs felt an unnatural fear when they were in his presence for very good reason. He is the first, he is the template, he is the original Primarch. If the Lion had been found first and the role of War Master was not so much overstuffed diplomat as it was strategist, then the choice would have been clear. And one can imagine that there is one Primarch the Chaos Lords fear. Yes, Russ may be able to best even a demonic Primarch, maybe. But it is the Lion that they must secretly quail over returning, because he is the perfect weapon against Chaos. Where Gulliman or Dawn would try to organize and gain control of a battlefield, a pointless exercise in the face of warp rifts and the powers of the Chaos Gods, it is the Lion who would not need to bother. He would be able to react to their thrusts, strange summonations and effects without batting an eyelid. So it may be the Lion who is the greatest fear of the Lords of Chaos. Reboot does what he can, to the best of his abilities. But if the Lion were to return, then we would see some heads crack open very swiftly indeed. But Reboot must also secretly fear the return of his antisocial and intimidating big brother, Johnson. For if the Lion were to deem him unfit to rule, and then challenge him, then not all of the forces of Ultramar, not all of the accumulated numerical superiority of the Ultramarines, or the vaunted powers of the art organizer would be able to prevent the Lion from taking what he wanted, even if it be the place as the guardian of the throne. Let us hope, for the Imperium and all of humanity, that when the Lion wakes, his detractors know what is best for them, and they direct him at the forces of Chaos, the Tyranid and the Necron. For in all of the galaxy, he is the only general who may be able to even challenge Imotech. The only one. We know he will arise soon. Let us hope that this lion does not awake. Hungry.